Assalamu alaikum. Uh, wa rahim. Again, today we continue doing our English uh, poetry course at the Islamic University of Gaza. Uh, last time we had a discussion on the nature of poetry and what to do with poetry in order to understand and approach poetry. I spoke about my major objectives in this course. We also spoke about uh, uh, like techniques in order to approach poetry. I'm going to be repeating some of these uh, issues in today's class as we define poetry and uh, continue to uh, take uh, examples of uh, uh, poetry from English and today we'll have an example from uh, Arabic poetry. Uh, if you remember, last time we concluded with one significant fact, which is if there is something in a text, in a, in, a, in a literary text, especially in a poem, it's almost always there for a reason. There's a purpose behind it. Poets select carefully their words, their images, their metaphors, uh, their sounds even, their rhymes, what to say and what not to say. This is a quote that I like very much about poetry. It says, uh, in poetry, every word and every sound and everything count. It has a purpose. It impacts the way, the direction of the poem. And it impacts the reception of the poem by, by the reader. Everything has its function and makes a difference. And we should always ask why certain words or sounds or phrases or images or metaphors are used instead of, of another. I, I try to, I claim sometimes that creative writing, poetry, fiction writing is a process of making choices, what to write and what not, what not to write. This applies actually to writing, to speaking, but because we speak involuntarily, when we write with academically or any kind of writing, especially uh, creative writing, we try to carefully uh, choose what to say and what not to say. And then last time, I kind of drew uh, the iceberg. This is an iceberg. Maybe the tip here is a, a, a lot bigger than the one I drew last time. But usually what we see is the tip. There's also an idiom in English that says it's only the tip of the iceberg because what's hidden, what's beneath, is almost always uh, uh, more, sometimes more important, more significant. So any person, any text, any poem shows us this tiny thing in the tip. Our job is to use what we see, the tip, and to dive deeper and make connections and try to understand the implied meanings, the things that are hidden beneath that can tell us many things, not only actually uh, beliefs and values and ideas and themes, but also things related to the form and the structure and the sounds of, of the poem. So, before I ask you to, to give me your own definition of poetry, I want to repeat something I also said last time. A poem shouldn't, shouldn't mean but be. Last time I said, don't let a, po a poem be engaged. This could be contradictory. Like, leave the poem as it is. And I don't want you to misunderstand me here. It means that no explanation, no summary, no interpretation of a poem can do any poem justice. Because if you want to explain a poem, you need to rewrite it, to say it in other words. And saying a poem, a text in other words, usually takes away the beauty of the text. And it, this happens to us all the time. Like you read a poem or you memorize a line or two lines of verse and you go to someone and say, hey, today I read these beautiful lines. Beautiful. What are they about? Like he's saying if, uh, 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 because you're courageous, you, can, you beat everybody, even the heroes. Like, okay. This idea, I get this idea all the time. People say it all the time. No, 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 but in the poetry, in the lines, it's really fascinating. The imagery, the sounds, the choice, the choice of words. So many people, I'm one of those people, I'm against summarizing poetry. If you want to say, uh, uh, to talk about poetry to people, show them the poem. But because this is a, uh, an, a poetry class, we need to try to understand and analyze and interpret poetry. What should we do? We need to follow particular 
techniques. I'm not going to say scientific techniques of understanding poetry, but some techniques, some methods and strategies in order to make, to appreciate poetry even, 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 even more. Okay? And here, this is uh, a significant point also. The, the, the only meaning of poetry that really matters is its effect on you as you read it or hear it. The impact of the poem on you as, as a reader. And again, don't let the poem be engaged. So there are two things here. We need to engage. We need to make the influence on, like, to feel the influence of the poem, the impact of the poem. But at the same time, we don't want to look at poetry as just uh, a story that I can rephrase and paraphrase. Because I have just said that every word, every image, every sound, every phrase, every metaphor is carefully and meticulously selected by uh, the poet. Now, uh, remember last time we came up with this list when we spoke about poetry? Rhyme, rhythm, sounds, lines, ellipsis, repetition. Sometimes poetry doesn't follow the rules of, of grammar. Now I want you to look again here, please, at this with the you know, imagery and literary devices and everything. Look at the list. I'm sure you'll still remember most of them. And I'll give you two minutes to try to come up with your own definition of poetry in the, light, in the light of these words, or if you don't want to use them, it's up to you. But when we said, uh, the spoke of the nature of poetry last time, we said, we, when we talk about poetry, we talk about these things, more or less. So, what is poetry? What is poetry? You don't have to be, you know, Shakespeare to define it. Just Tell me what you feel. Tell me what you think of poetry, the nature of poetry. If you want to define poetry, if somebody in a taxi, in a bus, uh, if your mom says poetry, what is poetry? Why is there a course for poetry in particular? Because there are other courses you study for. I know, short story, the novel, drama. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is one correct definition of poetry? No. no. Okay, thank you. This is not mathematics or physics, God forbid. So poetry is... Now, I want to give you one more minute to share your definition with your classmate. Show her your definition and see her definition of poetry. And try to see where you meet and where you differ. Could you please share your definition with your friend? Yeah. Same here. Yeah. I'll ask you two questions in a minute. How you define poetry, and then whether you agree or disagree with your classmate. Did you focus on the same thing? Are you jealous because your friend's definition is better than yours? Are you proud because yours is better than hers? You proud? Oh, excellent. This is the spirit. This is the spirit I want. Okay. You're proud of each other because you both did well. Good. That's the spirit. Okay. Somebody please share your definition. Oh, that's a big definition. It's also beautiful. Can you say it again? So there are words, definitely. There are words. And in words, we can find images. Actions, okay. And feelings. 
Wow, I like. Is the rhythmly even a word? Thank you for coining this. If it's not a word already, for rhythmly arranged. Yeah, to make a huge influence on, uh, on the reader's feeling. Okay, so there is a purpose here. You want to influence, to impact the readers. That's that's a definition. I think we that send it to me. I'll add it to to the book. It's beautiful. Please over there. Okay, so poetry, say again. Uh, is that group of words? Group of words? Designed, from the basis of designed. Designed? Okay, I like also the word design because it shows in intention. To? Uh, in order to reach into others. In order to reach others. To our so to reach out, express feelings and emotion. Fantastic. Please. So deep thoughts, necessarily, okay. Shared using metaphors and music and music, different types of, of music. So thoughts that are deep, necessarily, shared in a particular way, more, this way, please. In an, in, in an organized way using rhythm. Okay, very good also. There, yeah. Hanin. Could you speak up? Organized in? In a musical way? Following particular forms. Can, can somebody tell me... Uh, uh, something about your friend's definition of poetry. What did you like about your friend's definition of poetry? Did you find something that you didn't mention? Okay, what did you find? So okay. She said that she used the simile to talk about poetry where painting and pictures could be connected in a way. How? How can you connect pictures and how can you bring pictures and poetry uh, together? Because pictures, colors, but pictures use colors, paints, a canvas. And poetry, you, most of you just said this, poetry uses words, like Hamlet says, words, 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 please. Oh, that's, that's an excellent connection. The, the imagination, the visualization, yeah. poetry brings things to life. Okay? We always say show them tell, so this is probably one of the most important reasons why we, when we read poetry, we imagine everything as, a, as like a, a picture, a movie happening. Do, do you have to feel this all the time? No. Because there are some poems that are very abstract, intentionally done so. Okay, thank you very much. It's much deeper than saying that colors are used for paintings and words for poetry. They are all forms of saying a story in a different way. Like every picture has Like do you mean a story with characters every and poem has a story behind it and every mm. every piece of prose has a story behind it. So they are all different ways of expressing the story. So you're focusing on the narrative aspect here. Not this not all poetry is narrative. Okay, so the act of inspiration, the source of inspiration, the revelation here is, is different. Although you, we can find inspiration sometimes when you write your research paper or your, your MA thesis or BA graduation project. More? Again, not necessarily, not all uh, art, not all literature or poetry is rooted in, in reality. It's based on reality, sometimes on, you know, science fiction, on the future, on imagination, on things that, things that could have been, things that should have been, 
things I that might have been in the future. Not necessarily things related to life or deeply rooted in life. Everyone? It's influenced by real life, yes. Of course. It's like of course. But again, the influence varies from one person to, to, to the other. Yes. More. Uh, I think both of them are the same. They serve the same purposes, but the difference is that this is like different means, both of them. Okay, so the means here is different. different. The means, the medium here yes. is words, yes. and for language. But in painting, it's different. One more, somebody who wants to say their definition? I want to tell you okay. I want to say that I don't think that by saying that uh, poetry makes you imagine things that you're enjoying a whole picture in your mind. Maybe it's just the whole idea of making your mind work and not only uh, being confused by the, I don't know, complexity mm. or the ambiguity in the poem itself. So. So? so? so I think that it doesn't have to make, make you like draw a whole picture in your mind. Yeah, of course. This, again, it depends on how, like, the different schools of poetry, the different uh, 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 background, different philosophy, different age, different time. We see there is a movement in the 20th century, I'll give you an example for that, it's called imagism, where the whole poem is one image, concrete image that brings, like, expresses a particular, uh, could, uh, could be an abstract experience in an image. Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot. It's called imagism, a modernist movement, early 20th century. We can't imagine this poem. If you can't imagine, visualize, either the poem failed or you have, uh, you, you're hungry. Your imagination isn't triggered yet. Okay, definition? Uh, my definition is uh, the best words in their best organization. Mm. Uh, and also I want to share... Uh, no, no, how is that? Can you explain the... Because this is something good to say. Yeah. The best words... In the best organization. Yeah, because when, when, we, uh, when we have a group of words or when we want to, to write a poetry, we try to, to choose uh, uh, some words that is selective words uh, to, to, uh, to reach our meaning, maybe our feelings. Okay. Um, in best organization, because sometimes we, uh, when we, even when we write our uh, poetry for the first time, sometimes we feel the meaning will be better when we have This version. way, not this way. Yeah, in version. Yeah. Yeah. Fronting this word instead of that word. Yes. Okay. I think I like all your definitions. Uh, yes, okay, I, go I on. I want to share something that I read it uh, for uh, Samuel Johnson. They asked, uh, the, uh, they asked him about uh, what is poetry, and he said, Oh, I think it's easier to say what, it, uh, what it's not. What uh, it's not? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Samuel Johnson triggers me, actually, because he hates John Donne. And I wouldn't take him seriously. No offense to, if you like, Samuel Johnson. And because he was involved actually in the job, he, he said that John Donne doesn't write poetry. It doesn't necessarily, listen, in, in this course, we, we need to learn that there are no authorities that we need to follow 100%. Yeah, yeah. Even T.S. Eliot is the best poet in the 20th century, one of the best critics. But I sometimes, like even T.S. Eliot, sorry, T.S. Eliot, I see it the, the other way. He's different. And again, this is what I try to do, to encourage you to think outside the, 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 the stupid, cliché box. Think for yourselves, please. I like the way she defined poetry. Who's she? Who's she? Asma. Okay, Asma, go on. Because she said that the poetry is the overflow of the feelings and emotions using the simple words and to express what's going inside the... That's, uh, that's Asma Wordsworth. Okay, is uh, Wordsworth a relative, William? Do you know him? Yeah. Is he a, a friend, Facebook friend? Because this is closely taken from what Wordsworth says. Yes. One of the definitions that we will be seeing in a bit. So, so thank you very much, all of you. Okay, so I have six definitions here of poetry. Could you read number one, please, someone? Please. Po poetry is like painting. That's Horus. That's over a thousand, two th like almost <laughs> more than two thousand years ago. Poetry is like painting. Number two. If you notice, this is old, by the way. This is five hundred years ago or so. Painting, 
picture almost the same. This guy is Sydney, Sir Philip Sydney. Okay. Uh, with the end, most of you spoke about influencing others, impacting others, reaching out to others. In this uh, classical definition, now your classical definition of poetry, poetry has to teach, poetry has to delight. There is an end to poetry. They, don't, they didn't believe in art for art's sake, writing poetry just for the sake of writing poetry. Number three, okay, maybe Asma, she's familiar with this. Okay, this is William Wordsworth, a romantic poet. Now look at this, many people would just stop here at feelings. This is 50% of the, the definition. The spontaneous overflow, so it's feelings that are powerful with an overflow and at the same time spontaneous. It's not intentional, just say, okay, now I want to write a poem, I want to make a poem. You're just inspired by a natural scene, a scenery. The, the second part, we'll see how significant the second part is, recollected in tranquility. Recollected in tranquility. There's, there's uh, something related to memory here. Recollecting something, recalling something that happened in the past. In romanticism, uh, there is a difference between reacting instantly to an event and then absorbing it, bearing it in your mind and heart, and then when in <coughs> vacant or in pensive mood later on, recalling this experience. So feelings, we move from painting, from picture, to teaching and delighting, to feelings, internal, self-expression, yeah. that is recollected in tranquility. Number four, please. Okay, this is something interesting from Samuel uh, Taylor, another romantic poet and critic. Prose is words in their best order. Because we don't want to trash prose here. When we write prose, we also deliberately choose what, what to say and what not to say. But because sometimes we write a lot of prose, like you write a book, a novel, uh, a long research paper, sometimes it's really demanding, it's really not easy to choose and pick carefully everything you do in, in the text. But when you write a short poem, uh, half a page, uh, one page, two pages, basically it's easier. So poetry is the best words in their best order. Because the way you order things <coughs> matters. F five, please. Poetry, again, this is another romantic uh, poet and critic, Shelley. Shelley. Poetry makes familiar objects be as if they were not, not, not familiar, familiar, unfamiliar. Yeah. In, again, in Romanticism, there's something called defamiliarization. Mm -hmm. Is it Van Gogh, the guy? The, yeah, Van Gogh, the guy who draws the uh, the sunflower. You know, uh, yeah. keeps drawing the same thing again and again and again. Every time you see the pictures, like wow, as if you've never seen this again. In, in Romanticism, we call this the the, the the, the childlike experience. Kids always, almost always react to things as if they have just seen them. Unlike adults. So when we grow up, there is a veil, you know, of familiarity over our hearts and minds. We don't enjoy the beauty of things. And I usually ask this question to the students. When was the last time you looked at up at the moon and said, wow, what a beautiful scene. We don't. We don't have the time, we can't see because of the concrete, because we're busy, because we're spending 24-7 of our time uh, online, on Facebook, social media. When was the last time you stopped to, I don't know, to feed the cats here around campus, to look at the artificial kind of nature, the trees, the flowers, the roses. But look at the kid. The kids, when they see uh, things again and again, they just, okay, you know, when they start talking and they see the light, Dao, Dao, every time they look up, the like, Dao, right? The light, the light, they just keep saying the same word and again. And when they see the moon or they see a donkey in the street, it's like, ma, 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 right? Even if they see it like every minute or so. This is a romantic concept. That's why childhood is significant in romanticism. 
It's called defamiliarization, defamiliarization thing, defamiliarizing things in order for you to see them anew, to see them afresh. And Percy Shelley is one of the most fascinating poets of all time. He's a revolutionary uh, poet. Uh, number six. Please. Uh, there is magical creation of beauty for American poet and writer Edgar Allan Poe. Okay, Edgar Allan Poe also has a definition of poetry. There is mythical creation of beauty. Like you turn beauty, which is abstract, into something rhythmical, musical. You turn beauty right. into music, no matter what it is. Which one do you like the most? Please. Okay, why is that? Uh -huh. So the, the words themselves are poetic. Yeah, like the words are poetic. Okay, that's nice. A nice way of putting it. I like the sound of the words. Please. I like poetry makes familiar objects be as if they were not familiar. Yeah. Nice. The last one, because if you're Alan Poe is known for his tragedies, usually so the the whole concept. I don't know. I I think that there there is some kind of connection that he makes. Beautiful, what is really not beautiful, which is the whole concept of tragedies. But here he's turning abstract ideas of exactly. beauty into, kind, into music, into words, yeah. into forms, into small forms like babies, like the babies and how beautiful they are. More? Please? I like the first because like, the emotion has found its thought and the thought has found its form. Okay, what about the first one? Okay, well, but he doesn't say anything about, Horace doesn't say anything about, okay, the second one. To teach and delight. There are many people who always, always have a theme, have a, you know, a moral lesson at the end of their poem. Could be artificial sometimes, but they, you, they usually end their poems, you know, uh, what's that in Tuyur al-Jannah? Uh, it's like uh, some people feel that this is this is childish. If you end your poem, your text with a uh, uh, a glaring moral lesson, you're treating me as a child. Let me get to that conclusion. Let me feel it, experience it, perhaps. But this is the classical definition of poetry: to teach, to delight. You have to be entertained. And at the same time. You have to be instructed, taught. New morals, new manners, new techniques, perhaps new words, new language. Okay, I have six more definitions. I know there are many, but because we have so many uh, poetry, poetry movements, we'll have different definitions of poetry. Number, uh, number one, again, so six more definitions. Uh, Go on. Poetry is criticism of life. That's Matthew Arnold. That's almost like, you know, 150 years ago. Poetry is criticism of life. This is a Victorian. I'll, I'll give you a chance to comment yeah. on the definitions. A Victorian, a Victorian poet and critic. Number two. Please, yes. You know Emily Dickinson? Yeah. She's a, we'll study a couple of poems for Emily Dickinson, an American uh, uh, prolific poet. You know prolific? She writes a lot. Somebody who writes a lot. She wrote thousands of poems, Emily Dickinson. If you read a poem that makes my whole, if I read my whole poem, you know, like shudder and shake and cold, that no fire can warm me, I know this is poetry. Hmm. Beautiful expression. I'm not sure whether Nadia is going to like this or not. Because again, this is about the influence of poetry on others, on people, on readers. Number three, please. Poetry is a way of taking life by the throat. Throat. Robert Frost, American poet. Robert Frost. Poetry is a way of taking life by the throat. It's like 
this is not only criticism of life, just active, like inactively standing by and saying this is not what it should be. This is just even, you know, more violent, metaphorically speaking. Taking life by the throat. Because life sometimes doesn't obey us, doesn't listen to us. It's just, it just goes the way it wants to go. It doesn't follow our wishes and hopes. So probably in a poem you can come here. Four, please. Poetry is, an, is as exact as science as geometry. As okay. French novelist. French, he, French. It's interesting that he's a novel. I'm not sure if he's a poet also. Gustave Faulbert. Yeah. Poetry is as exact as science as geometry. It's like mathematics. Mm -hmm. Is it? No. Five, yeah. please. So this is not words and expressions, this is a step even or two further, syntax, grammar. Grammar. The way you arrange words, the way you put words, the fronting, the organization of words. How sometimes you break the rules of, of syntax, we just said that. The challenge is to make it do what you want it invisibly. Invisibly. You feel that there's something here, the poem begins nicely. It's so smooth at the beginning, but I can't, I don't know how and why. This here is about, this class is about trying to understand these, you know, invisible impacts. Sometimes people like, like, you know, like they, they bewitch us, kind of literally sometimes, with their rhetoric, with their words, with their poetry, with their writing, with what they say and how they say and like, we stand amazed, sometimes even stunned. And usually we don't know why. We know this is because of the beautiful uh, poetry or stuff they're reading. So let's try to dig deeper here and try to make connections in order to understand this invisible act of dazzling us. Finally, please. Unconscious. So there's the rhythm, the beats, the up and down, you know, the stress, the music, the internal music. Rhythm is the unconscious engine of poetry. This is a contemporary poet. She, I checked, she's still alive. Uh, Anne Stevenson. I don't know her. And also Susan Wicks is also uh, alive. So which one of these definitions you like the most or dislike the most which one please so that the, the emphasis here on how poetry reaches us gets to us is something you like please But isn't sometimes releasing anger or emotions, isn't it sometimes violence? Isn't it violent? I, I want you to imagine different situations. Like, okay, when, you, when, you, when you're expressing your actions and feelings and experiences to your family members, teachers or friends, probably you, you, you're peaceful, you're calm, you're non-violent. But some, remember we said poetry is a means of resistance. We said this. Look at Mahmoud Darwish saying, This is violent. And yes, this is some kind of incitement. Because incitement is sometimes good. This is not an invitation for violence, but sometimes you need to react to violence by violence. The poetry teaches us to do both. Number one here, taking life by the... I think... I don't mean here, I'm not sure what exactly he means, to be honest, but poetry helps us make sense out of the nonsense around us. We suffocate, we die. 
we suffer, we are humiliated sometimes. And when you write a poem, you're just attacking back. You're like holding life, controlling life and saying, hey, what the hell? Why is this happening to me? Why always me or why always us? So you try to make sense out of, of this thing because life is uncontrollable. Does a poem help us control life? Probably creating a better reality. It goes with the concept of art makes and creates life. I think, in a way. This is why it, the third one is my favorite. Uh -huh. I like your different opinions. Don't yeah. feel bad if you have a different opinion. Always say it. Okay. So. I want to say that it is like my favorite part because it is my favorite <coughs> definition because it's like you're saying that I'm choking life and I want it to give me what I want. So I want to create my own life. I am in charge. I'm the boss. Exactly, yes. Huh? So Thank you. Yeah. I, I also love the third. I love the second and the third. But, uh, but I still say that sometimes poetry makes us feel warm rather than cold. It does the opposite mm -hmm. of making us feel cold. And I, I love Robert Frost's concept because uh, sometimes poetry is like actually grasping, like grasping the meaning of mm. life. And this is not an easy thing to do. You need to struggle with yourself, with life. The other ones, like the first, the fourth, and the fifth, are so cold and narrow definitions, I think. It's like poetry, to me, is more about emotion. It's more about feelings and thoughts. Than science. science. Than science, exactly. Okay. And but can we pick and choose, can we just make, you know, the perfect definition of poetry, selecting and choosing from? Because even when you talk about rhythm and meter, they basically go under mathematics or geometry. Because things like engineering a poem, the, the, the rhyme scheme, the, the beats, the feet, the stressed, unstressed, but not in the literal meaning. They do, but to define poetry as only that is definitely. Yeah, definitely. Okay, we'll see. Okay. Or hair. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, for example, for me, I do always love the, the romantics. Uh, okay. Because poetry, I think, is just uh, self expression and releasing of inner thoughts and feelings. For example, for me, when I write anything, I, I even don't, uh, don't want any, anyone to, write, to, to read it. it is, it is it's very personal. Mm. Like what uh, William Wordsworth uh, says. Uh, but, but I think William, uh, the Romantics wrote in order also to be read. So why would you... As the Victorian Arnold said, okay. it's not a criticism or science. It's not criticism, it's not science. You think it's criticism? Yeah, because sometimes when you can't say your... When you can't criticize someone in directly. That's true. That doesn't have to be like criticism of life saying, okay, like I'm writing a poem, today's, uh, today's uh, pizza was horrible and the uh, cafeteria should be shut down. Uh, today's something, it doesn't have to be literally this way. And sometimes we read the stupidest poems about the stupidest things, but the, the most beautiful uh, things. We'll see some of these poems, that poems that could sound stupid and Nonsensical, but they're deep because they're true. They address, they reach us to uh, to us somewhere deeper. Please. Yeah. So somebody here is finding connection between uh, criticizing life and releasing your 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 thoughts. Okay. I like it when we have very different opinions, especially from friends. So I want you, uh, 
when you finish this class in, in the break, fight with, with each other, <laughs> argue, try to convince each other, or try to make your point clear. And this is how we have, we have fun. More, we don't have, sorry, we don't have much time, but somebody, somebody wants to say something that is significant, that if she doesn't say it, this course is not what it should be. Just okay, one line. Yeah, very short, sure that the criticism in, uh, in Arabic is differ uh, different uh, in English, because the criticism in Arabic, we have uh, like a, a bad th a thing, not bad things, uh, if you criticize something, we, we put the, the bad things that we have in, in, in something. But also there is but, but constructive. English, the connotation here, uh, in English, sometimes we criticize uh, things uh, like we want to, to say that to say something about this. Mm. In, in literature, when we say criticism, literary criticism, this is not like saying the bad things about yeah. the text. It's about so, appreciating it. It's about yes. trying to see so how it says I what it says. But again, even in Arabic, we still have constructive yes. criticism. No. I like the first one, the criticism of life, because it's duplicated our life as a Palestinians. We, in the recent year, we have seen many like poets, like Mahmoud Darwish, Ahmad Shawkar, Fadwa Turkan, Dhuyim Turkan, they are criticized the enemies. They criticize live. Yes, the special Israeli enemies through the hidden lines or powerful meaning. True, that could be also uh, uh, true. We can take this discussion uh, on the Facebook uh, group. I, I, I'll post these questions and probably we can continue this on Facebook. Okay, now I'll uh, tell you about an experience writing one of the most famous uh, haikus or 20th century poems by Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound is T.S. Eliot's friend. He's an early 20th century modernist, and uh, poet, and critic. Uh, he writes about his own experience seeing uh, he was somewhere in France in a uh, metro station. And he said he suddenly saw a beautiful face. You know, poets always see beauty in the midst of tragedy and stuff, or vice versa. And then another, and then yet another, and then a beautiful child's face, and then another beautiful woman. And he says here, I tried all day to find the words, look at the medium here, to find the words. So the emotions, the feelings, the, is, is, is there. And this is Isra Pound. To find any words that seemed to me worthy to describe this beautiful scenery. Or as lovely as the sudden emotion. He was taken aback, like all of a sudden, wow. We see this all the time. You, uh, a kid does something, you see a rose, a flower, or somebody does something, an old man, a, hope, a homeless a person does something, a taxi driver says something, uh, pizza tastes a particular uh, way, and then you're like, oh, this should be in a poem. And this is a poem. He said he failed the whole day to try to find the right words to express himself, to express what he just experienced. The sudden beautiful face and beautiful face and one more beautiful face. And then, in his writing, he, say, he tells us about the haiku. You know the haiku? It's a small Japanese poem. This is basically the essence of imagism, the movement of how poetry should be focused on concrete images. And then he, again, uses the Japanese haiku in order to tell us about his particular poem he wrote here. He said, a Chinaman uh, long ago said, if a man can't say what he has to say in 12 lines, in 12 lines, he had better keep silent. You know, people say crazy stuff all the time. You don't have to follow this. But this is, you know, significant in poetry here saying so many things, so much, in so little space, or so few words. The Japanese have evolved this still into a shorter form, the huku or the haiku, 
which is a type of Japanese poem with three lines consisting of five, seven, and five syllables. So the haiku is a Japanese kind of poem, three lines, five syllables, seven, 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 seven syllables, five. five syllables, and that's the whole thing. But it's so concrete that you can see, you can feel and touch the, the poem. He gives an example. The fallen, you know, the fallen blossom, you know, the blossom, the tree, the little flowers, flowers the, yeah. you know, the buds. The fallen blossom flies back to its branch, a butterfly. Of course, this is an adaptation of the haiku because the haiku is basically three lines, five, seven, five, seven. Now, those who like the painting picture definition can easily, if you have the skills, you can easily draw this. So trees in fall, when you know, the leaves, the branches, the, the buds fall down. That's the beautiful image. You know the cherry blossom, if you've been to America, you've seen this yeah. in Japan. Fascinating uh, scenery of how trees blossom and sometimes when they fall down. But this is the, the it's, it's actually, something from underground going up. I don't know why he's doing this, but I love this scenery when everything is falling down, falling down. Then one thing, one particular thing is rising up, is flying back to its branch, a butterfly. I mean, so many things are missing here. That you keep and I, I, I love this, I love the haikus. I usually go online to Twitter and just keep looking up uh, haikus because they make me, uh, Wordsworth says in one of his poems, the music in my heart I bore. And this is beautiful because you don't bear music. Music is abstract. So you bear something. Sometimes you feel there is you know, a burden on your shoulders and head and heart because you read something, because somebody said something to you. So here, I, 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 the, like usually haikus haunt me for, for a lot of time. So he says, okay, there is this uh, haiku thing that he knows. And he gives another example that, again, I love very much. He talks about a guy, I don't know this guy, Victor Plar, tells me that once when he was walking over snow with a Japanese naval officer, they came... Uh, to a place, across a place, where a cat, imagine the, the scene, it's snowy, it's snow, it's white all over the place. They came to this place where a cat had crossed the, the path. So this is the snow, and then there is this cat. If you have a cat, probably you'll feel this more than anyone else. That's it. If you look at, at it from afar, from a distance, it's beautiful. Especially with, you know, the tiny pose the, the, you know, because it, it, it's going to sound something like this, probably, I don't know. And then the Japanese man, and this is what I like about this story, he said, stop, I am making a poem. It's like, stop, I am being inspired because people who, you mentioned Ahmad Shawqi, the Egyptian poet, not the Palestinian poet. Uh, Ahmad Shawqi uh, uh, had his beautiful way of writing poetry. He just gets the inspiration and he stops talking to people and he keeps walking to and fro around the, the place and he holds a pen and he writes whatever he, on his hand, on the pack of cigarettes, he writes the poem, the inspiration. If he doesn't write it back, probably it's going to, to he, he's going to forget it. Yes. But this guy says, stop, I am making a poem. And the act of, because poetry in its root, originally, poetry means to make something to make something, to create something, to build up something, to construct something. So he says, stop, I am making a poem. We usually make up a story, we make cake or pizza, okay? So, and the poem goes roughly like this. Look at this, how easy but difficult at the same time. The fourth steps of the cat upon the snow. It's usually the second part that surprises us, catches us by surprise. Usually these poems don't have the linking verb, so it adds more to the poeticality of the poem. Plum blossoms. You know, the plum blossom plum, plum and the blossoms, the, how the, these trees they have the beautiful flowers when they blossom. So the footsteps 
of the cat upon the snow are like plum blossoms. So our friend Ezra Pound said he was inspired by these things. Again, he failed. He was inspired by it. But look at how Ezra Pound, as a Western European guy, how he's appropriating Eastern Japanese things. Because if the haiku is originally uh, three lines, five uh, syllables, seven syllables, and then five syllables. Look at how he's distorting this and appropriating it, changing it. As if saying that, okay, it's nice, but there's always but. And that's why they would be appropriating this. So finally, he wrote the, the famous poem. But he says, I wrote, like months later, two months later, I wrote a 30-line poem about that particular experience and destroyed it because it was what we call our second intensity. It's artificial, in a sense. It's not what he wanted, it's not what he felt. It wasn't genuine. Six months later, I made a poem half that length. Still destroyed it, still second intensity. A year later, I made the following haiku. One of the most famous poems. This is a poem. The apparition, you know apparition? It's like the ghost. Apparition. Ghost. The apparition of these faces in the crowd. Look at a year later, the beauty of the faces at that particular time and place turned into an apparition. Probably something spooky, bleak. Petals on a wet black bough. You know the petals? You know, this is, yeah, is it, in Arabic they say batalat. So this is a petal, this is a petal, this is a petal, this is a petal. But look at the choice of words. Like, if this is, uh, if, if every petal is uh, a human being, it's going to be like petals on a wet. Not just wet, also black. It's beautiful, but it's also haunting. It's not haunting, it's like it was raining and I had an image. Okay. It's like it was raining, so it was just branches wet and petals fell from some blossom or some kind of rose or something and they stuck to the bow. It's like they were okay. a significant thing. Don't you think the word, don't you think the word apparition is key here. Yeah. Parish, what doesn't he say? The faces, the anything, the, the pictures of these faces in the crowd. He says, apparition. Maybe it's his way of saying that I don't exactly remember how they look. It's just blurry image. Yes, yes. They were beautiful. Most of them but, beautiful. Look at, yes. but look at this experience, like so many things. Imagine writing 30, 30 lines and then 50 lines and then a year later, Okay, I want to appropriate Japan and then say what I want to say and look cool. I love this poem. Can I say something? Can I say first that I don't like the haiku at all? It's, 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 it's me, okay. Reader, I can't love reading such poems. I can't love reading that the poet tried so hard to recollect his thoughts and... Uh, Not necessarily. And Sometimes when you are a poet, yeah. you are a poet. You just keep writing. It depends. You, you're right. You're definitely right. But what is challenging about this is the fact that the unsaid is a lot more than what he says. There is a lot to excavate. The hidden meanings. The, 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 the stuff between, uh, between the, the... even He doesn't even use here the verb. Is it is? Is it was? Will be? So is he talking about now? The past? The present? Makes you think. So I'll ask you to think about trying to write a haiku. Listen, the Japanese haikus, you will love them. So you just uh, Google Japanese haikus, famous Japanese haikus, and try to read them. You'll, you'll feel probably, uh, uh, no offense to Ezra Pound, he's a great poet, but if you don't like Ezra Pound's haikus, 
probably you can read somebody else's. They're beautiful. Again, the challenging thing is that you need to put so many things, so many feelings and emotions in just two lines. Please. Possible, yeah. Yes, Possible. Possible. I like the whole concept of haiku, but I think that it goes against the, uh, the idea of spontaneous overflow of feelings that we said before. Because, like, he spent a whole year just to come up with those words. And but the same, listen, the same with Wordsworth. Wordsworth didn't write his poems instant. Uh, 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 Wordsworth also believed that second intensity, react, reacting to a particular scene, is not good, it's not, it's not romantic enough. So he would take it and do it later. I, I want to say that when I first, when you asked us first to write our definitions, I said the word like precise and to the point in my definition. I didn't think that it was very significant, mm. but I think that here it fits like in finding this particular kind of poetry. Okay, thank you. So we, we conclude with Ezra Pound saying, all poetic language is language of exploration. It's like kids exploring things. The kid. A one-year-old kid would say, open the light, if the head thou. Huh? Right, right? They don't know the proper collocation here, but they would say this word, and the word here, open, if the head thou, is a word of exploration. The kid is still exploring. But sadly, when, when we grow up, when we go to school, we learn to limit our imagination or something. So uh, Ezra Pound is saying here, you need to uh, explore. You need to break all these bar barriers because poetry is basically a metaphor. To avoid the thoughts that have been already thought out by others. The thoughts, if you don't explore, you will end up repeating and saying, well, I think Antara says, Hal ghadara shu'ara min mutaraddami am hal arafta dara ba'd tarahumi. Antara, the Arab poet 2,000 years ago, almost 2,000 years ago, says that poets have said everything I want to say. But why did he still write poetry because he was exploring and the other Arab poet I will mention this later on so many times he said I'm, I'm quoting other poets I am imitating other poets I'm echoing other poets we repeat poets repeat each other in order to avoid this you need to explore with image with with experiment with imagery with language everything okay now I'll conclude. I, I expected to do more, but we'll see here. Uh, so there are four ways, four phases to approaching a poem. One, two, three. Like you'll, you'll find different people saying different things, different books, different sources. But I like to follow this kind of system that you don't have to follow it as, you know, like literally. Number one, when you read a poem, Try to notice things about it. When you, when, you have to, when you have to do a poem to understand it, to read it, to analyze it, first don't read it, just look. Notice things. The size, the form, the shape, the repetition. Deal with the text as if it is in a language you don't understand, because I don't want you to read. Is it a short poem? Is it a long poem? Are the lines the same size? different sizes? Can you find repeated words, repeated phrases? Does it begin in the same way? Does it end in the same way? Step number two, read the poem and read it aloud. Poetry is meant to be read aloud. You don't read the poem aloud, you still miss a lot. You're lucky, most of the poems we have here are already available on YouTube and sometimes recited hundreds of times by people around the world. You can do your own recitations, by the way. Upload them to YouTube, that would be fun. So read aloud, and this helps with the music, basically, the rhythm, and also the tone. Is it a sad poem? Is it a bleak poem, dark poem? Hopeful, optimistic, pessimistic? And then try to understand the meaning, the direct meanings, the meanings of the words. And at this phase here, you need to check the dictionary for words you don't know. Please don't come to class, for example, you know, in, in, the, in one of the groups I was explaining how sai, what sai indicates in Ali Abu Nama's poem. 
And I realized that a couple of students don't know what the word Sai means. You, we're not native speakers here. The words are not difficult. But you need to check the dictionary. You don't have to prepare before class. But before you come here, please open the poem, highlight the difficult words, find their meaning. This is the only thing I want you to do. You could do more, of course, but this is enough. So the difficult words come to class. The next class we'll see, we'll study a poem by Tamim al Barghouti. I was planning to do it today. And a poem uh, by Sir Thomas Wyatt, Who Saw Less to Hunt. Who saw? This is a new word. What should you do? Go to the dictionary. Number four, and this is where we do our business here. Read between the lines. Connect between the form and the meaning and the shape and the idea and the words. Analyze the sounds. Answer the question, why? So what? Why is this repeated? Why does this sound like this? Why is the rhyme uh, uh, different, regular, irregular? So link the form and the meaning. Aim for the implied, for the things between the lines. This is close reading we mentioned before. And again, the metaphors, the literary devices, and the imagery. What I usually do, remember Ali Abu Nama's poem? We noticed things, and then we tried to see, read it aloud, and then to see what new words probably. Uh, sometimes, number three, by, by the way, sometimes you, you would not be able to understand what the poet means. Because poets say stuff. Even poets themselves sometimes don't know what it means. Ishiani, I never clothed the newborn desert. I don't know. But this is the beauty of, it doesn't mean, uh, I don't know means, means I'm not 100% sure, but I can still guess. I can give an idea. We'll see how things go. When we comment on a poem, finally, on a text, whatever you do, base your opinions and thoughts on the text, on ideas, on evidence. I could claim here that there could be two types of evidence. Number one, textual evidence. The poet repeats the word nor, nor, nor three times. The poet ends with the same rhyme scheme, I, 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 I sound. The poet begins with I and ends with I to support your argument. Okay, always do this. In exams, in your discussions, most of you forget to do this. This is, to me, more important than anything else. Get used to saying, the poet is doing this, the poem is saying this, because in the text, for example, in the text, it goes like this. Number two, evidence based on thoughts. Again, going back to Ali Abu Nama's poem, we said, the question, replying to the question whether the poet, the speaker, will change or not, yeah. some of you said, yes. I think he is going to change because the very act of writing the poem is an act of change. This is evidence still. Not based on something in the text, based on logic, on my understanding of life, thoughts, connecting things, connecting the dots. Could it be historical, historical not, not, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I, I usually don't like to go uh, to the background or something. So I don't want to go and call Ali, what did you do when you, when you write this poem? What did you change in your life? I don't care about this. But this is it because second, even ev evidence number two is still something around the text. Writing the poem itself. When you say, for example, I take this as evidence. This is what I'm saying. So uh, if I ask you a question in your exam, is Ali Abu Nama going to change? Give evidence from the text. You could say, I think he's going to change because the very act of writing the poem is evidence of change, writing, speaking, releasing the thoughts. Someone else might say, yes, because in the text, he uses the word regrets, and regrets is plural. So he's not regretting one thing, he's reg regretting many things. Uh, uh, in the text, he uses the past simple tense. I never uh, failed. And then there were other verbs, filled, clothed, couldn't. The use of the past simple tense here indicates, this is evidence, textual evidence, indicates something that happened in the past, and there's a promise here that this will happen, will happen uh, uh, no more. Uh, for next class, ladies, 
We're going to examine Tamim al Barghouti's poem, part, only just the first part of it. Again, this is in Arabic, I know. We'll comment on it in English, but we'll study the Arabic text and see how everything we said so far can be applied to, uh, to this poem. If you have a question, a, a, something to say, please go on. So you're saying in poetry you have to have this, this, stuff, this moment of identifying with the text, which is a challenge. But in, in, in prose, in novels, we find this all the time, yeah, basically. Like for me, I'm yeah. by, uh, until I feel like it's this is for you and about you. Nice. That, that's, that's, that's so true. But also, sometimes we still like and identify with text. Because as human beings, we identify with people around the world. The struggle of black people in America, the struggle of uh, South Africans against apartheid. Yeah, but the level of touching us is depends on how okay. much... Yeah, I see, I see your point. I see your point. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll stop here and see you next time, inshallah. Atikul Afiyah. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>